Well, we love you. Well, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. Now and forevermore. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. Man, I like you guys. This is my first time here. Actually, to be honest, it's my first time in San Bernardino. It's the first time flying into Ontario. If I'm honest with you, I never even heard of Ontario, California before. I, when I got to the airport this morning, I flew from Florida. I got to the airport and I looked at my ticket and it said Ontario CA. So I called my assistant. I said, am I going to Canada today? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I already feel like I'm part of the family here. You guys said it. Part of the family. <laughs> Pastor Marco, where are you there? And, and Pastor Lisa, you guys are amazing. I love their hearts. Come on, do you love your pastors? You know, I, I'm a pastor myself, and so I, I understand the challenges of pastoring. And a lot of pastors, you know, it's just part of the job. They sort of get caught up in the four walls, and it's, it's just basically about maintaining a little uh, ecosystem. And... When I meet a pastor who has a heart for the city and a heart for the nation and a heart for the nations, there's a resonation that happens in my heart. I know that God has called you here. I see the anointing in the hand of God upon your life and your ministry. And I can't wait to see what God does because the best is yet to come. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, what you just saw on that screen, that's... Uh, that's my uh, home group. That's, <laughs> that really is um, what we spend most of our lives in the ministry of Christ for all nations doing. And it, those numbers that you saw on the screen are actually out of date. We have seen since 1987, at this point, nearly 90 million documented decisions for Jesus Christ. And... Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, that's not uh, an estimation. That's not a, you know, let me see a show of hands and we think that's about a million people. We don't do it like that. The only numbers that we count are the people that attended one of the crusades live in person. They heard the gospel preached. They raised their hands and said, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus for the first time. A counselor went to them and prayed with them. They filled out a decision card with their name and address and contact information. And then that was used to lead them into a local church to be discipled. How many of you know Jesus didn't say go and make converts, he said go and make disciples. And so we don't consider our job as evangelists to be finished until that new convert has made their way into the local church and that is 90 million since 1987. And so we are living in a season of harvest and I know that here your hearts are also burning for a harvest here in California and in the United States. And I believe that it's coming in Jesus' name. And I say to you what Evangelist Bonke used to say over the African continent, America shall be saved. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. Well, let me just share with you what's on my heart very quickly, and then I'm going to preach. I'm going to be respectful of the time here, and I'm really believing that God is going to meet us. How many of you are ready for an impartation tonight? I'm going to preach to you as an evangelist. You know, if, if you didn't want an evangelistic preaching, then you shouldn't have brought an evangelist. You know, that's kind of how it goes. But I'm going to preach to you as an evangelist who has spent years of his life in revival, in harvest, in a season of outpouring. Ever since I was in my teenage years, I was a part of a revival movement in the 90s. And then I went straight from that into working with Evangelist Bonke in Africa and seeing one of the greatest moves of harvest in history. And I know one interesting fact about the outpouring of the Spirit and about impartation. This is an impartation conference, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't get poured out and the power of the Holy Spirit doesn't manifest because we talk about revival. 
The power of the Holy Spirit comes when people turn to Jesus. I've learned one thing, that the Holy Spirit lingers at the foot of the cross. And so when the life of a person is surrendered, then the Holy Spirit comes in and fills that person. And you will never be filled with the Holy Spirit more deeply than you are surrendered to Jesus. And so that's where we're going today. And I believe that this is not just for a few. I believe this is for everyone on some level. In fact, I'm preaching to myself. By the way, whenever I preach, I'm preaching to myself. Even when I preach the gospel, I'm preaching to myself because the gospel doesn't just save us one time. We are continually saved by our continual revelation of the gospel. Amen? And I believe there's going to be a mass outpouring of the Spirit here tonight and mass deliverance and mass salvation in Jesus' name. So you came to the right place. Come on, will you just take your hand and put it on your heart? Say, Lord Jesus, speak to me tonight. Change my life in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm going to be reading from the book of Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to be talking about um, a guy by the name of John the Baptist. Anybody heard of him? If you have your Bibles, let me see. How many got those old, good old-fashioned paper Bibles? I wish I had a prize to give to each one of you. Matthew chapter number 3. Of course, John the Baptist, if you're not familiar, he was the man that introduced Jesus, who was actually his cousin, and he's considered by theologians to be kind of the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he is very much in that vein of the Old Testament type prophets who are speaking with great authority and great boldness, and they're using very vivid, colorful language. How many of you like communicators that are colorful and interesting? I hope I can channel some of that John the Baptist flair tonight. John the Baptist, as he is, is introducing Jesus, he's going through Judea baptizing. And here we pick it up in verse 1. It says that in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everybody say, repent. Amen. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was the locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they wanted to be baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath which is to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I want you to notice that these people that he's talking to now, these are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you remember from the Gospels, these are the people that were always conflicting with Jesus in his ministry because they were kind of seen as the religious leaders, but they were actually just religious hypocrites. How many of you know there's nothing Jesus detests more than a religious hypocrite. He'll take the sinner before the hypocrite. He'll take the drug addict and the, the prostitute and, and he'll take the thief and the, and the adulterer and the murderer before he takes the religious hypocrite. Because at least a sinner in their sin can acknowledge that and be honest about their situation. But the religious hypocrites, Jesus described them like a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. On the outside they look good, but on the inside they're full of putrefaction and decay and rot and death. And so, these were probably the guys that had actually gotten John the Baptist kicked out of town. He wasn't in the wilderness because he liked heat. He was out there because he'd been persecuted by these very people who are now coming to him and I think he had good reason to question the sincerity of their motives. So he says, you brood of vipers, why are you coming here? Who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Verse 9, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he is, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, 
and gather his wheat into the barn, but his chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Say amen. amen. Now, for all of the Gen Z folks, I see a lot of young faces. How many of you are Gen Z here tonight? Okay, I, I realize lately that I'm, that I'm actually a part of the older generation. I, I have this, this young lady that came up to me a few months ago, and she looked at me with great sincerity in her eyes, and she said, I just want to thank you that someone in your generation is ministering to our generation, and I was insulted. <laughs> Could not, I'm like, what are you trying to say? So what I did was, I wanted to make sure that all of you young people, I noticed you're, you have this lingo that's very, uh, it's very special. And so I thought I would get a little bit of help from ChatGPT, and I asked ChatGPT to put this into Gen Z lingo for me, okay? So this is not the inspired and fallible word of God now. This is a, this is a um, paraphrase courtesy of ChatGPT. You ready? So this is, this is that scripture. Yo, back in the day, there was this homie named John the Baptist chilling in the middle of nowhere in Judea. He had this one message for everyone. Yo, peeps, you got to change your vibe. Because some epic heavenly stuff is about to go down. Now, John's fashion game was lit. He rocked, a cam he rocked camel hair threads with a slick leather belt, and his grub was locusts and wild honey. People from all over, even Jerusalem and the whole Judea squab, were vibing with John. They lined up by the Jordan River to get baptized and spill their sins. But when John peeped some of the Pharisees and Sadducees rolling up to his baptism bash, he straight up roasted them. You snakes who told you to dodge the incoming rage, show some real change, squad. Don't be thinking you're good just because you're Abraham's minis. Brah, God could make homies out of these rocks if he wanted to. The ax is already at the base of the tree. If your tree doesn't drop good fruit, it's getting cut down and tossed into the fire. This is pretty good. I'm dunking you in water to flex repentance, but the one coming after me is on another level. I'm not even worried to carry his Jordans. He's going to come in clutch and baptize y'all with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's got this pitchfork, and he's going to sort the good stuff into the barn and burn the trash with an unquenchable fire. That's some savage stuff for real. All right. How many of you understood that one? Okay. Now we know everyone that was Gen Z. Can I get some water from somebody? Just, uh, just in case I have a feeling I'm going to need it. I want to draw your attention here in this passage to three vivid pictures. I told you that as a, as a prophet, one of the things that John the Baptist was known for was that his message was not just something he said. He illustrated it with very colorful, powerful word pictures, with metaphors. And there's three metaphors in this passage that I want to draw your attention to very quickly. The first one is an axe. Somebody bring me an axe. Thank you. We got an axe wielder somewhere around here. There we go. There's my axe man. Oh, no, just. This is a heavy axe. I got to wield this with one arm and preach. Okay. Look at, look at what he says in verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I want you to see this image of an ax. And I'm glad they took the little rubber stopper off it because I wanted it to be nice and sharp. <laughs> because John was talking here about a situation in Israel that Jesus would draw upon the imagery later. I don't know if you remember this story, but Jesus told a story of a vineyard that had a bunch of trees and one of the trees wasn't bearing good fruit. In Luke chapter 13, verse six, Jesus said a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So check this out. He says to the owner of the vineyard or the keeper of the vineyard, cut that tree down. For three years I've been coming to look for fruit and I haven't found any. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears no fruit next year, fine, then we'll cut it down. I want you to notice the reason that 
the master of the vineyard wanted that tree cut down. It wasn't just like, well, there's a tree in the vineyard. It's not producing any fruit, but it's still, you know, it's kind of nice. It throws some shade. It's not hurting anybody. Let's leave it, in, leave it alone. No, he said, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? In other words, there is no such thing as a harmless tree that is not bearing any fruit. It's taking up space and nutrients and sunlight. It's weakening the soil and it's bringing harm to other trees in the garden. There's no neutrality in this thing. You are either on fire for Jesus or you are a liability. Just hold that. Just hold that ax so everyone can see. Lukewarm Christian, you are the devil's greatest weapon against the gospel. Because when people look at your life and they see that it's no different from theirs, they say, why do we need your Jesus? I see people, they're so worried about radical Islam. They're so worried about terrorism. Can I tell you something? The greatest danger in this world is not radical Islam. It's lukewarm Christianity. The greatest danger in the church is not the prostitute. It's not the drug addict. It's the lukewarm Christian that's taking up space in the pew refusing to be hot or cold. They won't, won't turn left or right. They think that by staying neutral, they can just play the game and skate through and arrive in heaven by the skin of their teeth. Can I tell you something? There's no skin on your teeth. Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. What am I telling you, friends? It's time to stop playing church. It's time to drop the act. It's time to drop the charade. Jesus is walking through his vineyard. He's got an ax in his hand. He's looking for fruitless trees. If you've been living a lie, if you've been a hypocrite, if you've been a fake Christian, I want you to understand the ax is already, John says, laid at the fruit of the tree. There's another image here. I could go on and on. I could preach the whole night about the ax, but I got to keep moving. There's another one. And it's a winnowing fork. Somebody bring me a winnowing fork. Come and stand on the other side over here. This is, this is very much like what a winnowing fork would be like. And if you don't understand what this was for, you need to understand the agrarian culture of the people that John the Baptist was speaking to. We don't farm very much in the modern world. At least most of us don't. But in those days... Farming was something that everybody had an understanding of because it was happening very close to where they lived. And in those days, one of the most common crops, one of the staples was wheat. And by the way, back then, the wheat had not yet been genetically modified the way that it is today. I, I don't know if you realize this, but the food that you get in the grocery store, that's no, not the way God made it. That's people been messing with it for a long time. So nowadays, our wheat produces a tremendous amount of grain compared to the husk that has to come off. But in those days, I mean, wheat was basically like a cultivated weed. And what that meant was there was a tremendous amount of chaff, they would call it. It was like the useless part of the husk that had to be taken off so that you could get to the good pieces of grain that could be useful for making bread. And so there was a very complicated process. They had to first take the sickle and go cut the grain down then they would bring it in in bushels, and they would bring it to this place called the threshing floor. Everybody say the threshing floor. The threshing floor was a place of separation. Say separation. It was where the wheat and the chaff were separated. And there was different ways they would do this. Sometimes they would take sticks and they would beat on those, chaff, those, those stalks of wheat until the grain and the chaff started to separate. Then sometimes it would go into another stage where, for example, they would have oxen drag big stones over it to break it down and break it apart more. But then here's the problem. Once you've done this process, you've got this big pile of wheat and chaff mixed together. So how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Well, what you do is you take one of these things, this, one of these winnowing forks, and you use it to scoop up some of that grain and chaff you throw it into the air, and then the wind comes and, and blows the light, worthless, empty husk away. And then at your feet will fall the useful 
substantive pieces of grain. So Jesus is this man John describes as one who, he says, is already on the threshing floor and his winnowing fork is in his hand. What is John saying? He's saying, look, this might have been theoretical at one time. Some of you, maybe you grew up in the church and you've heard preaching all of your life. You've heard about a day of separation coming. Of course, the Israelites were like that too. They knew that there was a day of reckoning coming. But what John was telling them was not just that the separation is going to happen. What he was telling them is Jesus is already on the threshing floor. In other words, this is not something that's going to happen one day. This is happening right now. Separation is happening right now. Dividing sheep from goats is happening right now. Separating wheat from chaff is happening right now. And guess what happens to the chaff? After it's all over, it gets swept up and put into the fire. That's the end process. My friend, listen to me. God is long-suffering. He's patient. He's been tending his field lovingly. He's been giving space for as much fruit as possible to grow. But my friend, there is a time coming where it's time to reap. There is a time coming where the window of mercy begins to close. Clouds start to gather on the horizon. The season is about to change. The season of love and mercy will soon be replaced by a season of wrath and judgment. Harvesters are about to be released. They're going to gather the wheat and they're going to bring it to the threshing floor and a separation will begin. In fact, John is saying, look, the, the winnowing fork is already in his hand and the fire is already kindled. He's about to thoroughly go through and sweep out the, flesh, the threshing floor. The chaff is going to be burned with unquestionable fire. My friend, listen to me. Whatever is dead, whatever is of the flesh, whatever doesn't have the life of God in it, whatever is born out of selfish ambition, whatever is steeped in pride, whatever is unholy and ungodly, and whatever is unrighteous, it is about to get blown away. Psalms chapter 1, it says that the righteous are like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in their season. I've known this passage since I was a little boy. The righteous are like trees planted by rivers of water bringing forth fruit. Can I tell you, that is what the picture of a true Christian should be. A tree planted firmly, bringing forth fruit in season. But then he contrasts that with the ungodly. He says, the psalmist, they are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Can I tell you, there's some people, Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed, remember this? There's some people that their, their roots are so shallow that when the first wind of persecution comes, they just blow right away. There are some people that they're in it. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There are some people that are here tonight, some guys, you, you came here to look at the girls. You came here, you're pretending to be some spiritual guy, but you're just looking. You're just looking for your next target. Can I tell you, there's a wind that's going to blow and separate weed from chaff in this place. There are, there are some of you that are Christians because you thought that God was going to make your life better. You, you, you got saved for what he could do for you instead of what you can do for him. And, and you find yourself even now in a bit of a difficult situation because you got saved on the, on the premise that this was going to be good for you. And ever since you got saved, you discovered the devil's been fighting you harder than ever before. And now you're wondering if it's even worth it to serve the Lord. Can I tell you, this is not about you being comfortable. And let me tell you something, the Bible says in Hebrews that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that can be blown away will be blown away. Jesus said, a foolish man is the one that builds his house on the sand. And then the rains come and the floods come and the wind beats upon that house and great is the fall of it. But the one that builds his life upon the rock... The one that builds his life upon Jesus Christ. The wind comes and blows and beats on that house, but it doesn't fall down. I'll tell you what, the Apostle Paul 
in 2 Thessalonians talks about a great falling away that is coming. I believe we're living in that time right now. I don't know if you have seen it, but I've seen it all around me. I've seen it even in the highest levels of church leadership, of falling away. And he says in 2 Thessalonians 2, that it's coming with all kinds of deception and lying signs and wonders and with all unrighteousness and deception among those that perish because, listen to this, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Listen, this is so important. They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Whew. We live in a moment in world history and even in the church where people want Jesus, but they want him to be packaged in a way that conforms to their expectations and their desires. They want their version of Jesus. Can I tell you something? Everybody loves Jesus. They just love their version of Jesus. And if if you've been around for a while, you learn that everybody's got their Jesus. The Muslims have their Jesus. The Buddhists have their Jesus. The New Agers got their Jesus. The criminals have their Jesus. The mobsters have their Jesus. Everybody's got their version of Jesus. Can I tell you something? You don't get to make God in your own image. You don't get to decide who he is and who he is not. So what happens is the truth comes. We don't like the truth. We go after the lie instead because that's what we want to believe. And guess what happens? It says that he sends them strong delusion because they would not love the truth. He says, you want to harden your heart? Like Pharaoh, I'll make it even harder. There's a separation coming. The wind is going to blow. And people who would not receive the love of the truth and would not believe the truth and have pleasure in unrighteousness, they're going to be separated by a wind of strong delusion to believe the lie. There's one more picture that John uses here, and it's a broom. Somebody bring me a broom. It comes stand right in the middle. He says in verse 12 that he will clear his threshing floor, and he will gather the wheat into the barn. Here, you can take the dustpan. I don't need that part. The chaff you will burn with unquenchable fire. You see, there's stages to this thing. Number one, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. So there's a cutting down. But it's not just going to come down. Then it's going to be separated. The winnowing fork is in his hand. But then he's going to clean. And he's going to clear. And he's going to sweep out his threshing floor. And he's going to gather the wheat into the barn. But the chaff he's going to burn with unquenchable fire. He's not just separating that chaff. He's sweeping it out. I tell you, when Jesus gets done with his fleshing floor, it's going to be so clean, you'll be able to eat off of it. Somebody said to me, they said, Daniel, the Bible says that in the end, everything, God is going to reconcile all things to himself. He's going to reconcile all things to himself. And they said, does that mean that in the end, everybody's going to be saved? I said, no, that would, that's not biblical. We know for sure that everybody's not going to be saved. Then he said, what does it mean that all things will be reconciled? It means this. Now, some of you are too young to remember checkbooks. But how many of you remember when you had your checkbook, you had to go through and you had to balance the checkbook and you had to make sure everything equaled out at the end. You had to reconcile everything. All the accounts had to be reconciled. All the debts had to be reconciled. Everything had to be made right. That's what it means. It means that what's going to happen in the end is that Jesus is coming like a judge. He's not coming back as a little baby born into a manger. He's coming back with a fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. His axe is laid at the root of the tree. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to sweep out his threshing floor. Then when he's done, there's not going to be a trace of unrighteousness. There's not going to be a trace of wickedness. There's not going to be a trace of ungodliness. He's going to clear his threshing floor. The wheat he's going to gather into the barn and the chaff is going to be burned with unquenchable fire. Not one act of injustice is going to remain. Hey, if you've been mistreated, if you, have you been abused, 
if you've been taken advantage of, can I tell you something? There is not one thing that's going to be left. Not one I that won't be dotted. Not one T that won't be crossed. My friend, let me tell you something. You don't want to be out of order when Jesus is on his threshing floor. But here is the beautiful thing, okay? Here's the beautiful thing. This is kind of a scary thing, right, to think of the judgment that's coming. But here is the reality that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that if we would judge ourselves, then we don't need to be judged. See, you don't have to wait until Jesus shows up with an ax. You don't have to wait till, till the angels come out with their winnowing forks, until the, the floor is being swept and the fire is burning. You don't have to wait for that because if you would go ahead and take the ax into your own hands, and you would lay it at the fruit of your own fruit, the, the root of your own fruitless trees. And you would begin to bring down the things that are unpleasing to God. Guess what? You won't be judged. Well, maybe I should say a little bit differently because you can't fix yourself up, really, at the end of the day. I don't know if you've figured that out yet. But you, you can try. But it doesn't work. But here's what you can do. You can Surrender. And you can say, Lord, bring, bring that axe. Lord, bring that, bring that axe and lay it at the root of my fruitless trees. I surrender to you. Bring that winnowing forth and begin to separate the holy and the profane. Begin to separate the things that please you from the things that don't. You can say, Lord, begin to sweep out every nook and cranny of my life. Cut down the things that aren't bearing fruit. Get rid of the hypocrisy. I'm not going to play games in the church anymore. I'm not going to have a divided heart anymore. I'm not going to live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world anymore. I'm not going to compromise. I'm no more lukewarmness. The apathy, the complacency, the half-heartedness has got to end. I've got to get rid of these fruitless trees. It's time to become a man of God. It's time to become a woman of God for real. Not just pretending anymore. It's time to turn off the television. It's time to turn off the video games and the Netflix and the Instagram. It's time to start gathering your family together. It's time to start praying together and worshiping together. It's time to prioritize the secret place again. It's time to make room to seek the Lord and to study his word. It's time to get passionate about souls and passionate about the things of God. And then that winnowing fork, it's time to get rid of the impurity. It's time to get rid of the compromise, the worthless things, the empty things, the things that don't matter. How much of our lives are spent, wasted on things that don't matter. That's why the writer to the Hebrews admonishes them to lay aside every weight and sin. You see, there are some things that are sinful, but there are other things that may not be wrong in and of themselves. But if they're pulling you down, if they're weighting you down, if they're keeping you from serving God with your whole heart, they need to be gotten rid of just as passionately as if they were sins. And it's time to clean house. Right here at the beginning of a new year, it's a perfect time. This is a perfect time to get rid of all the junk, to clean that closet out. To get ready for the new thing that God's going to do in your life. And then the theme, you know, kind of the, the overarching theme of that whole word that John had was this one word, repent. Everybody say repent. repent. So this is the key. The word repent in the English actually comes from two Hebrew letters that are put together. They are the words sheen and bet. Sheen and bet. The letter sheen means to destroy. It means to press with the teeth. If you saw the letter, it looks like three teeth. It means destruction. It means to burn something. So you take the word sheen, which is to burn down or to destroy, and you put it with the letter bet, which is, you might be familiar with this one. It's the word for house. So like if, if you see a, a synagogue, sometimes it's Bethel, Beth, bet el that means house uh, of God. Bet El, house of God. Or, or maybe it's Beth Shalom. That means the house of peace, right? So the word Bet is house, and Sheen means to destroy. When you put those two letters to get together, that is the word repent. So what does a house 
and destruction have to do with repentance. C.J. Lovick says it like this. The literal translation of this word is to return to or turn about, and it's used to mean repent. The two pictures of Sheen and Bet are connected in a way you may find surprising. Instead of turn or burn, the Hebrew word Sheen Bet has the idea of destroying or burning down the house. It could literally be translated burn or destroy and then turn around and leave. The concept is eloquently simple. If you burn the house down, then you cannot return to live there anymore unless you want to spend your life among the charred ashes of death and destruction. <laughs> to repent, based on the ideal picture meaning of Sheen Bet, is to leave the place you were living never to return. It has been crushed, burned down, demolished, destroyed, and there's no reason to return. Can you say amen? Will you guys put your hands together for my volunteers? Thank you, guys. I've got a couple minutes. Do you mind if I tell you a story? Can I give this to somebody? I want to tell you a story that I tell sometimes in Africa. And I don't know why I am thinking of this right now because it wasn't part of the plan, but I just feel like I need to tell you. I think somebody needs to hear this. How many of you have been serving the Lord for, let's say, less than five years since you got saved? Let me see your hands. That's amazing. No wonder I feel so at home. How many of you have been serving the Lord for less than one year? Let me see your hands. Come on, man. You know what I love about this? I see so many. Pastor, I want to just say this. One of the things I notice that's just outstanding, there's so many men. So many men that are serving Jesus. And listen, people are people, man or woman, same value with God. But I've noticed in the church there's often a great lack of men. And sometimes real men don't want to go to church because all the men that are in there are these sissy boys. If you're a sissy boy, Jesus loves you too. But it's nice to see some men in the house. Why am I saying all this? I have no idea. <laughs> but but here, here is the reality that many times we begin to follow Jesus, we, we begin to serve the Lord, and the enemy doesn't leave us alone the moment that we surrender our lives to Jesus. That's not how it works. In fact, the opposite is true. The minute you surrender your life to Jesus, it's like a big bullseye is put on your back. And now the enemy is out to get you. And if, if you haven't learned some really important lessons, you're going to fall away before you even get a chance to be in the game. I heard this story from Reinhard Bonnke. He, he made it up. And he said there was a, it's a parable now, okay? You guys know what a parable is? A parable is not a true story. This is an allegory. It's a story with a meaning, but it's not literally true, but it carries tremendous symbolic truth. So Reinhardt said there is this man, a very wealthy man, and he had a big house. It was a mansion with two floors. One on the, on the top there was five rooms, and on the bottom there was five rooms, ten rooms in all. And one day, this man heard a knocking at the door. And when he opened the door, do you know who was standing there? It was Jesus. He was shining like the sun. And that man was so happy, he said, oh, Jesus, I've heard these great stories about you. He said, Jesus, here's what I want. I, I want for you to come into my house. And he said, Jesus, if you will come into my house and stay with me, I will do something wonderful for you. I will give you the very best room in my house. It's a room upstairs, big master bedroom with a the big king-size bed, California king. It's called contextualizing. It's got a big window looking out over the yard. He said, Jesus, you can have that room if you'll stay with me. Well, Jesus is a gentleman. He said, thank you very much. He came inside. He went upstairs. And the man was happy. But that night, there was another knocking at the door. Can I, can I knock on this? I don't want to blow the sound system out. It was a terrible knocking. And when the man heard the knocking, he thought, who could it possibly be at this hour? I should probably look and see. So he turned the doorknob and he cracked the door open and do you know who was standing outside? It was the devil. Come on, let me see the devil horns. And when the man saw the devil standing there, he said, oh no devil, I don't want you in my house. 
I've heard about you, how you paralyze people and torment them with fears and tears, with addictions and compulsions. He said, I don't want you in my house. And he tried to shut the door, but it was too late. The devil had already put one toe in the door. And can I tell you something? This is always how the devil works. He always starts with one toe. Well, people think, oh, it's just one toe. But I tell you what, it never ends with a toe, does it? Soon his knee was in the door. And then his elbow was in the door. And then his shoulder was in the door. And soon that devil had burst his way into the man's house. The man was fighting with the devil through the night. But the devil was too powerful for him. Pouring filthy temptations over him all through the night. Finally, the next morning as the sun was rising, the devil slipped out the back door and disappeared. Just about that time. Jesus came down from upstairs. And when the man saw Jesus, he said, oh, Jesus, I forgot about you. He said, Jesus, look at the mess in my house. The devil broke in last night. Look at the mess he made. And then the man thought for a moment. He said, wait a minute, Jesus, why didn't you help me? You were here the whole time. Surely you and me together, we could have double teamed the devil. Jesus has said, sir, sir, it's true that you gave me a room in your house, but there are 10 rooms here. Nine of them are yours and only one of them is mine. Oh, oh, the man said, yes, 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 you're right. He said, here's what I'm going to do for you, Jesus. As of this moment, I'm going to split my house with you 50-50. Five rooms on the bottom for me, five rooms on the top for you. Well, Jesus is a gentleman. He said, thank you very much. He went upstairs, and the man was happy. That night, a terrible knocking. And when the man cracked the door open, do you know who was standing there? And do you know what happened? The devil broke in, tormenting that man through the night, pouring filthy temptations over him. Lust and fear and anxiety and addiction, all kinds of garbage was poured over him. They struggled through the night. Finally, early the next morning, as the sun was rising, the devil slipped out the back door. And just about that time, Jesus came down. And this time when the man saw Jesus, he got angry. He said, Jesus, what is wrong with you? I have been more than generous. I gave you five rooms in this house. And yet you did not lift one finger to help me last night. Jesus said, sir, 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 calm down. He said, it is true that you gave me five rooms, but the other five rooms belong to you. The man said, oh, Jesus, you're right. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do, Jesus. As of this moment, I'm going to give you all the rooms in my house except the one where I sleep. Nine rooms for you, one room for me. Because Jesus, look, there are some things in that room you would not like. I mean, let's just be honest. I've got some things in that room. There are adult things, you know. There's some things I keep to myself. They'd make you a little uncomfortable. Some things under the bed, some things behind the door, some things in the closet, some things up in the ceiling. Those are my personal things. I want to keep those to myself, but you can have all the rest. Well, Jesus is a gentleman. He said, thank you very much. He went upstairs, and that night... A terrible knock. And you know who was there? Come on, you guys aren't helping out very much. I'm starting to think I need to go back to Africa. And you know what happened? The devil broke in, tormented that man through the night. And then finally, the next morning as the sun was rising, the devil disappeared. Just about that time, Jesus came down. And this time, when the man saw Jesus, he started to cry. He was crying like some of you cry at the altar every third Sunday at church. And he was was crying and he was saying something like this, Oh, Jesus, don't you love me? The devil keeps hurting me. Jesus, why won't you help me? Jesus, why do I keep struggling with the devil? Why do we keep going around and around with these same things? Anybody, anybody see what I'm talking about? Okay. Jesus put his arm around that man. He said, sir, 
He said, let me help you. He said, it's true that you gave nine of your rooms to me. But sir, the title deed of this house is still in your name. That means you are the master of the house and you invited me to be your guest. But sir, if you are the master of the house, then you must be the protector of the house. If you're the master of the house, you must be the provider of the house. If you're the master of the house, that means you are the owner of the house. So, sir, why don't you do this? Instead of inviting me to stay in your house, give your house to me. And then I will invite you to stay in my house. It was like scales lifted off that man's eyes. Yes, yes, this is what I must do. He reached into his pocket. He pulled out the keys. He put them in the hands of Jesus. Jesus said, thank you very much. He went upstairs. And the man was happy that night. A terrible knocking at the door. And I tell you, as soon as that man heard the knocking at the door, his knees started knocking. Because he'd been through this so many times. He knew what was about to happen. He knew the devil was going to break in and torment him and pour temptation over him and bind him with fears and tears and addictions and compulsions. And his trembling hand was reaching for the door. He was just about to open the door when he felt something. A tap on the shoulder. He turned around. And do you know who it was? It was Jesus shining like the sun. Jesus said, excuse me, sir. I believe this house belongs to me. Please step out of the way. I will answer the door. But Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't crack the door and peek out. Oh, no. Jesus isn't afraid of anybody. He threw that door open wide. He said, who's there? Well, some of you think Jesus was a little limp-wristed, lily-white, hippie flower child. Let me tell you something. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Do you know who it was? Do you know who was there? Who was it? Who was standing at the door? The devil looked up and saw Jesus. But then he looked at the number on the house. Something was wrong. He looked at Jesus again. Looked at the number, Jesus, number, Jesus, number, Jesus, number. He couldn't figure it out. So he backed away very slowly. He bowed himself to the ground. And this is what he said. Excuse me, sir. I think I've come to the wrong house. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? You're about to get a change of address. When the devil comes looking for you, he's not going to find that old house anymore, that old life anymore, that old man anymore, that old woman anymore. You are going to be free in Jesus' name. Come on, stand to your feet. Now listen, this is serious because there has got to come a moment of surrender. Some of you, you gotta, I know that imagery of the ax laid at the root of the tree. I know that's brutal, but that's what's gotta happen. It's gotta be a complete surrender tonight. 50% is not gonna cut it. 70% is not gonna cut it. Some of you came here for an impartation, but what you need is surrender. You don't need another little dab of anointing. What you need is to surrender your life to Jesus. I'll tell you what, you surrender to Jesus, you'll have more anointing on your life than you'll know what to do with, I can promise. Some of you have been dealing with the same addictions, the same struggles, the same attacks for years. Some of you have been around the church for a decade, and you're still going around the same mulberry bush with the devil. It's time to get free tonight. 
I don't know if there's going to be room in this altar, but here's what I want for us to do. I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes because look, if you don't have enough guts to do this in front of a few Christians that love you and are totally on your side, then you'll never have the guts to do it when you walk out of this place into a hostile world. But if you say, Daniel, I am surrendering tonight 100%. I'm going to surrender everything to Jesus. Get yourself down here to this altar right now. Jesus. Jesus. And when you get down here, don't wait for somebody to lay hands on you. Begin to cry out to the Lord. Begin to surrender to the Lord. Say, Jesus. Save me. Jesus, take my life. I surrender all to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The aisles are full. Keep coming as much as you can. Listen. Just the aisles are filled and there's hardly room, but I'm not going by what I see here. I'm going by what I sense in my spirit. You know, they say that when a man is drowning, He'll go under the water one time and he'll surface. And then if he's not rescued, he'll go under the water a second time and he'll surface a second time. But they say that if that drowning man goes down a third time, he will never come up again. Here's what I feel in my heart, that there are some of you in this room You've already gone down once before. God had mercy on you. God brought you out. And instead of surrendering to him and serving him with the rest of your life, you went right back in and you went under a second time. There's some of you that are listening to me tonight, you should not even be alive. You should have died in a drug overdose. You should have died in a car accident. You should have died in that drug deal that went wrong. You should have died in prison. You should have died from some venereal disease. You should have died of cancer. You should have died of AIDS. But instead, Jesus had mercy on you. And you're standing in this room, and it's evidence of his mercy and his goodness and his love. But here's what I feel in my heart, that if you leave this place tonight, not having laid everything down, and if you go under another time, there are some of you, there will not be another opportunity. That's why I plead with you, as the writer of the Hebrews said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You know that verse is a terrifying verse. You know why? Because it means that you could actually hear the voice and not respond to it. Can I tell you something? You've heard the voice tonight. But now it's up to you. So here's what we're going to do. And and believe me, I know we don't have room for this, but I feel it in my heart. I feel it like I know my own name that we have to do this. And this is not just going to be another opportunity. This is going to be like a visible demonstration of the mercy of God reaching to you, okay? Here's what's going to happen right now. When I tell you, not now, but when I tell you, I want every person to turn to the one on their right and their left. If you're not already in the altars, I'm talking about everybody else. Turn to the one on your right and left, and I want you to say this to them. Do you need to be down there at that altar? And if they say yes, I want you to take them by the hand and come with them. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they sing in the choir. I don't care if they're related to the pastor. I don't care if they're the nicest looking, best dressed person you've ever seen. Right now, turn to the one on your right and your left and say, do you need to be down there? And if they say yes, Take them by the hand and bring with them. Bring them with you. Come on, can we put our hands together for these ones that are coming? You are so welcome.
Okay. Those that, are, that have answered the altar call, whether you're in the aisles or you're in the front, listen to me for just a second. Bring the music down just a tad so I can talk here. Listen, I have no interest in going through some re religious formality with you. I, I, I really don't even ca care about praying the sinner's prayer with you. Okay, listen, if this is just going through the motions, it is pointless and worthless and maybe even counterproductive. The Bible doesn't say to pray a sinner's prayer at an altar and a church service after an altar call is given. But here's what it does say. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes the art, most articulate prayer would be just someone falling on their face and say, Jesus, help. I tell you, he'll respond to the cry of repentance from any person who would call upon his name. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put my arm around you and I'm going to help you to put words to the cry of your own heart. But don't think that it's about the words because it's not. Jesus doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak Spanish. He doesn't speak Portuguese. He speaks heart. It's only heart that he's listening to. And so I want you to pray with me, but I don't want you just to pray words. I want you to pray from your heart. And if you will, here's what's going to happen. Are you listening? You're not joining a church. What's happening is, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What happens is now, right now as we pray, the Holy Spirit of God is coming to live on the inside of you. You are about to be possessed by the Holy Ghost. And, and I say the word possess. Some people say, oh, you shouldn't use the word possess. You should only use that of the devil. I say, oh, no. The devil doesn't possess anything. In fact, in, in the Greek, it never says that the devil possessed anybody. The devil gets no ownership over any human being. You by right belong to Jesus. He paid for you with his blood. And that's how, why I say the Holy Spirit will possess you tonight. He will make you his own. Can you say amen? Are you ready for that? Yes. This is the most supernatural thing that could ever happen. And it's about to happen to you right now. Lift your hands with me in the altars. And actually, I'd like everyone in this whole crowd to do this with me in support of those doing it for the first time. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Do not whisper. I want you to pray with all your heart. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Yes. Say, dear Lord Jesus Christ. I come to you tonight. A sinner needing salvation. Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot save myself. I surrender all to you, Lord Jesus. I believe when I confess that Jesus died on the cross for me. That he rose from the dead for me. That he is the King of Kings. And he is the Lord of my life. As of tonight, I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me. I believe it. I receive it. I confess it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, 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 amen. Now take hands all over this place in the altar. Just take hands right now. Take hands, take hands, take hands, take hands. The Holy Ghost is about to fall right now and touch you and fill you. Come on, I just want, take hands. Don't lift your hands. Take hands with the person next to you. Take hands with the person next to you. I want you just to begin to pray right now, out loud. Open your mouth. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers, 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 rivers. Prayer team, begin to lay hands on them. In Jesus' name. Rivers of living water, rivers of living water, the power of the Holy Spirit fill you right now in Jesus' name. Fill you now in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the power of the Spirit. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus name. 